a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a rock. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expounding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very Expanding reality. Welcome to Expanding Reality. I am your host, Brandon Thomas. On this episode, guys, we have filmmaker and Egyptologist and professional photographer and just all around amazing guy extraordinaire, Curtis Ryan Woodside. Now, all the ways to find him will be linked down in the show notes, uh, linked down there as well. If you want to expand your experience with us here on the show, you can do so at expandingrealitypodcast.com. Now, in this episode, guys, uh, Curtis and I go through his films, which will again be linked down in the show notes. He's a phenomenal documentary filmmaker, and he is a incredibly cool talk to when it comes to Egyptological uh, history and facts and art, and it's really, really cool conversation. So without any further ado, let's get to this amazing conversation with Curtis Ryan Woodside. All right, ladies and gentlemen, everyone out there, fans of mystery and amazingness, we have the one and only Curtis Ryan Woodside on with us today to talk about all of the cool things. Now, Curtis, you are an incredible filmmaker, photographer. The list of your achievements so far at, the, at your young age is insane, and uh, it's, it's incredibly impressive. So uh, before we get going into your work, if you don't mind, just introduce yourself for my audience that may not know too much about you. Okay, well, like you said, uh, thank you so much for the, the really great introduction. Um, yeah, I am Curtis Ryan Woodside. I am a filmmaker and Egyptologist, um, and I make mainly Egyptology documentaries. Um, I've recently just relocated to Italy, so that's given me a, a whole new chance to explore new aspects of Egyptology seeing with the Roman connection and all of that. So I've been making films since I was like very young. So, you know, I've been doing this for a while now. <laughs> <laughs> Did your parents get you like one of those little plastic cameras to run around with and pretend to film and then you just took off? Yeah. Of yeah. That is exactly it. My dad brought me a little camera and I went over to my friend Alicia's house. We were like, 10, 11, I'm not sure. And it was raining. So we're like, well, hey, let's make a movie. And, uh, you know, you can get some really good ideas and some really bad ideas when you have nothing else to do. <laughs> that is very true, yeah. So uh, we started making movies and they were, were sort of like murder mystery kind of movies. Okay, that's fine. Um, so that's what we, we started doing, and it's just evolved from there. I'm now making documentaries that are on, like, Amazon Prime. Um, she's become a music producer that does, like, sound scoring for, for media. So it's really strange how something that started from so young, we've all stuck with it. That's pretty cool. Do you use her music in any of your films? Not yet, but I have... Hopefully next year when I get to go to Egypt to shoot some very badly documented temples that have not really been documented yet. Oh, cool. Um, I want a specific sound, so I'm going to gonna ask her. But I have used her for like commercial stuff. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's cool. And I love it. And it's uh, that rising tide raises all ships model. I love that. Um, so your, your work in what you do with tying Rome and Egypt together all over the place is absolutely fascinating to me. And I, I wanted to ask you about some crazy cool conspiracy stuff that I've heard about with Egypt being everywhere and like a global civilization. And so in, in some of your films, um, specifically, um, like we checked out the Egyptian secrets at Pompeii, which was great. Uh, my oh, wife and I watched you. that last night. It's, it's really, really well done. Like your, your cinematography, your shots, your, 
uh, just, ang- I mean, everything about it is so visually appealing. You're so knowledgeable about the time period and what the dynastic period that you're so entrenched in. It's fascinating. And the way that you deliver the information is great. Like, I can't say enough great things about you, but you're, the way that you, the focus on the Egyptian tie to Rome is amazing, especially when you think about like Caesar and Cleopatra. Uh, and again, artifacts found all over the world. So what got you going down that vein originally? Um, I had, for the Egyptian secrets at Pompeii, I had visited Pompeii 2019. Um, and I just was like wowed by it. But I did start to notice things. As an Egyptologist, you specifically are trained to notice for Egyptian stuff. Mm-hmm. And walking around Pompeii, I could see Egyptian influences all around. And of course, there was the Temple of Isis. The worship of Isis had spread throughout the entire Mediterranean. But there were more Egyptian clues there than I could have expected. Um, so when I, when I was planning now to go back to Naples, I thought, okay, great. I need to research this more. And from my research, I found that there was a lot of connection with Pompeii and Egypt. And the archaeological museum in Naples, they have so many Egyptian artifacts, but they have Egyptian artifacts that were found at Pompeii. Okay. And these artifacts were now, they're not all held together. So you really have to explore the entire museum. It's not like it's a there in your face. Wow. Okay. This is now what was found at Pompeii. That's Egyptian. And there were some stelas found, um, which really linked in for me to go, okay, there were definitely Egyptians living at Pompeii, not just, you know, that they adopted the religion. There were actually people from Egypt who moved there. So that's kind of where it started from. I just needed to tell the story. It's perfect. And you did a great job on it. And aren't there a lot of cultural influences in Pompeii? But the Egyptian one, the Egyptian tie is very interesting. And because it's in the south of Italy, it's just odd that where it's located that Egyptian would have made it that far north. Well, you know, the Egyptians did have an extensive trading route, Um, not only just for trading, but during the reign of Ramses II, um, if you don't know, he's like my speciality. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. you might be hearing his name quite a lot during this interview. Um, during the reign of Ramses II, before the Battle of Kadesh, which was Ramses' biggest battle against the Hittites, he had actually gone to what we believe is Sardinia. And there were a group of people they called the Sardan, which is where we believe the name Sardinia comes from. And he recruited these these soldiers from Sardinia to come with him into into the Battle of Kadesh. So there's already a connection there that's even more north of Italy. So for them to be in, in Naples is not that strange. And, you know, we have this whole connection with, which I think is extremely fascinating. Someone said to me, a, a Greek guy said to me, isn't it interesting how the Egyptians and the Greeks never had a war against each other? Oh, yeah. That, that is interesting. Think about it. Think about it. And when I was when I was told that, I was like, wow, you're right. Egyptians and Greeks have not ever had a war against each other. They've always been friends, they've always been allies, they've always traded. So for the Greeks who had now found Naples and then basically moved to Pompeii as well, why would it be so strange that their friends in Egypt were not told, hey, we founded this city, we're going to be trading, we're going to be going around, why not come check it out? How how unplausible is it that the Egyptians didn't move there because of the Greek connection? Yeah, 
And that makes a lot of sense. And it's almost interesting when you, and we talk about mutually beneficial relationships with trade and commerce and things like that, which is wonderful. But also you, you think about that it may have been something deeper, like with the, like we were talking about the, um, Cleopatra connection uh, to Julius Caesar. And it may have been like a cahoots kind of a thing, like mob families, maybe for an analogy, you know, just kind of getting along and benefiting from each other mutually, which sounds like what happened. And especially when you tie a love story into it, it's even better, right? Exactly, exactly. But the Egyptians were, were involved with the Greeks many years before Cleopatra. So the fact that a lot of people think that the Egyptian influence would have more or like more or less arrived during the Roman Empire is actually wrong. Yes, the Romans then started taking on Egyptian beliefs and Egyptian customs and things like that, like the Romans did with everything else. <laughs> um, but, you know, the Egyptians and the Greeks were, were allies way before. We have evidence from the early, seven, uh, early 18th dynasty where we see Greeks arriving in Egypt. That is about 1,600 BC. So that's way before 30 BC where we know where Cleopatra was around. Right, right. So Julius Caesar and Cleopatra, yes, when you know they got together, there was a huge influx of like Egyptomania, if you yeah. can call it that. <laughs> that's good. For sure. For sure. Um, but it, it was around way before that. Do do you find Greek and Roman influence in Egypt kind of the inverse, or is it all mainly Egypt taking over and, and finding civilizations outside of itself? Inverse, you mean, how do you mean? Like, instead of just finding hieroglyphs in Rome, do we find column structures and mathematics from Greece in Egypt? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that sort of came in during the Ptolemaic era. So when Alexander the Great arrived in Egypt, he actually, when Alexander arrived, he wasn't opposed by the Egyptians. He was actually welcomed as the liberator because he had chased out the Persians out of Egypt, um, which is another example of Greece and Egypt being closely linked because there's no... There was no fight when Alexander arrived. They were thankful that he arrived. But from his time, then you start to see, yes, there are sort of Greek influences, especially with Alexandria, which is a very Greek city. But the Egyptian culture was so strong that even the people who invaded took on the culture. So we know the Persians when they invaded. There's examples of Egyptian architecture out in Iran. Um, you know, so we know that they had taken architects and builders from Egypt to Persia. So it's quite interesting how the Egyptian culture could not really, it couldn't be subdued. Yeah. So yeah. it took over the invaders. Yeah, that's interesting. It's almost like a beautiful parasite, you know. It's and, and it's almost like the people they invaded wanted to assimilate into that culture in ways because they found it, I don't know, appealing and mysterious in all sorts of really cool ways and beneficial for them to do so. That's that's yeah. really interesting. So uh, yeah. you you have a new film that you've uh, just put out, uh, Nefertiti: The Life of an Egyptian Queen. Tell us about that. That is so cool. Yeah, so uh, Nefertiti, uh, wait, are we talking about the, the, the Nefertari one? Yes, Nefertari, yes. Yes, yes, okay, because there's a Nefertiti one coming. But That I'll one's coming soon, that. the one out, Nefertari, is what I was talking about. Yeah. Yes. yes, thank you for the clarification, um, because you do have that new one coming out, and it's going to be great. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, no, I, I have uh, Nefertari, The Life of an Egyptian Queen. Um, which is on YouTube. It will soon be appearing on um, some of the Little Dot Studios streaming sites. Um, but yeah, the Nefertari documentary, I wanted to tell the life story of Ramses II's favorite wife. She's not very well known and she does get confused a lot for Nefertiti. Two different people. 
And another thing, Nefertari gets shown often and people label her as Cleopatra, which infuriates me because here's a queen who actually was very powerful. She was almost co-regent of Egypt and she's getting mislabeled all the time. So I wanted to make this documentary to tell her story. And I had done so much research about her that has never been told before. So that's where that came from. That is so cool. I, and then it's just like your, and I'm going to mispronounce the hell out of this, but your Princess Amunindris, the 25th uh, dynasty. <laughs> I'm an Indris, yeah. I'm an Indris, okay. And whenever you met her uh, in the Vatican Museum, it was fascinating because you get so excited because you know, you, you like have been looking forward to seeing this mummy for a very long time, something I'd never even heard of. And then you explained everything about it. I'm like, yeah, that is pretty dope. So uh, tell us about that because that's very interesting. You know, when you, um, when you study a person in history, and we have to remember these are people, you become attached to them, sort of. So when, like when I would go to visit Nefertari's tomb, it's like an overwhelming experience because you feel like you know this person, but they're not there. With Amenhotris now, Amenhotris was born in Nubia, which is south of Egypt, and she was adopted during the 25th dynasty um, by an Egyptian priestess. So adopted back in the Egyptian time is not really as we think of adopting now. It was adopting her to give her the status so she can you know, inherit the, the title of high priestess, which is exactly what happened to Amenhotris because Amenhotris was the daughter of a Nubian pharaoh. So to in integrate her into Egyptian society, because during the 25th dynasty, the Nubians had taken over Egypt during that time, to integrate her into the society she was adopted. So her, her tomb was in Thebes and she's one of the only 25th dynasty royals, Nubian royals, that were buried in Luxor, in Thebes. And her tomb was found with a lot of her grave goods. And somehow through whoever found it, because long ago, um, before 1922, it was accepted by the Egyptian government, whoever found it, if they approved, the pieces were taken out of Egypt. So Amenhotris and her tomb contents ended up at the Vatican. Um, and I, I've just, I had studied Amenhotris extensively because I find the woman in ancient Egypt more interesting than the man. And um, when I saw her mummy, her face is covered. It had been opened, but it was covered. When I saw the mummy, it was like, you can feel the presence of the person because it's a body, but yes, there was a spirit attached to it. So there is energy around that body of that person. So it was very exciting for me. Yeah. It's amazing. Uh, and it is, that's one of the ways to get into Egyptian royalty is by, I guess, uh, wanting to marry up to assimilate into, but then also, you know, the basket down the river route, like the Moses took, you know, that's another way too. There's kind of a couple of little loopholes to pop in there. So it is interesting too, that we talked about culture, uh, the Egyptian culture assimilating the people that embark upon it, just like you. It seems, I mean, you're from South Africa. So what got you excited about Egypt in the first place? <laughs> so, yeah, I am, I am from, I'm from South Africa. Um, what got me interested was the 1999 mummy movie. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. That's a great answer. <laughs> yeah. I watched that. I was on a bus to go and visit my grandmother and they were showing the, the Brendan Fraser mummy movie. And I just fell in love with just the way everything looked. And it was just like, 
wow yeah. to me. And I never got to see the end of the movie because we arrived before the movie finished. Spoiler alert, it all works out. Well, I've seen the end about oh, five okay. times. <laughs> <laughs> so from there, I just started, you know, reading, watching documentaries. Um, my dad bought me like a little golden sphinx when I was like six years old. Um, I just became so into it. And then, you know, I would watch like on National Geographic, Discovery Channel. I would watch people like Zahi Hawass, Salima Ikram, Kara Kumi. And what's amazing now is these people have become my friends. Um, and to me, it's sort of unbelievable that I looked up to these people and now we're able to like, get on the phone and say, Hey, how are you? Did you hear about that? Whatever. For me, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I get the same thing on this same exact thing. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so from a very young age, I was so interested in the history of ancient Egypt it, and it's something that's never gone away. And I don't think it will ever go away. Egyptology, it's worse than any drug you can come up with. Uh, you know, it's worse than Egyptology is finding out that maybe Egyptology is hindering you from the true mysteries of the Giza Plateau. And I want to get into that, but we'll, and we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. Uh, but I want to uh, just touch on before before we go down that rabbit hole, because I've got some that I want to ask you. Uh, let's talk about the uh, obelisks that have been relocated, because this is something I find very, very interesting. Uh, would you please go into that? So which obelisks would you like to know about? Because there are actually more obelisks out of Egypt than in Egypt. I knew you'd answer it that way, and I appreciate that. Please continue. So if we look at Rome, there are tons of obelisks that were taken to Rome, about 13. Um, and, you know, some of them were given as gifts from Cleopatra to Caesar. Um, some of them were just relocated there by Roman emperors to place at the center of the, of the square, you know, just to mark that, hey, I am in charge of Egypt right now. Um, a lot of them had themselves added onto the obelisk. So you'll get an obelisk from Ramses II, but you will have a, a Roman pharaoh depicted at the bottom. Um, it, it's really strange. Yeah. Uh, so these were taken there, and we actually have one in the center of the Vatican, which... <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah. It yeah. is claimed that this obelisk was received um, as a gift from, from Cleopatra to Julius Caesar, and it was uninscribed, a blank obelisk. Now, we're educated people. If you look at the obelisk and the sun is hitting it in the right way, you can see where the, the, the markings have been chipped out. And this is something a lot of people don't realize. There were actually hieroglyphs on the obelisk at the Vatican. They have just been removed. Crazy. It, they put them all over the place. I know there's some in the U.S. Like you said, there's more obelisks outside of Egypt than are in Egypt. That's insane to me. And and it was. It was I get the phallic and the um, Osiris connection and... I get all of that, but what do you think um, about the claims that they could have been and that the pyramids themselves were power generators and that the obelisks were actually a way to send that power out like antenna and that the cultures around the world figured this out and got this technology from Egypt. Therefore, that's why they moved the obelisks. The other interesting part is where they moved them to. So bringing them out of Egypt I think every single one of the obelisks check it has a there was a checklist that went off and it's like in a Masonic city. Uh, they're over ley lines or over natural aquifers. There are a lot of things that point to that they were deliberately placed there, not only as power uh, status symbol, but as power like power like electricity for uh, free energy, and that they act like antennas, like I said, in resonant chambers that draw energy out of the earth. And even um, Nikola Tesla talked about this, and he built his. Uh, tower out in Jersey uh, to mimic the exact way that the pyramids themselves were built to produce free electricity. Have you done any digging into that at all? 
I am not the biggest lover of pyramids. Okay, just as a concept? Uh, I've had a very bad experience on the Giza Plateau. So I, before I even witnessed the pyramids, my, my mind shut off. So I think there might be a, a stunt there. Um, I'm not, the, I'm not the, the biggest lover of pyramids. I just, you know, there's so many more interesting things in Egypt than pyramids. That's fair. Yeah. Because that's a focal point for many people, but you're outside of that looking at the other interesting things. That's no, interesting. I'm like, you know what? If you go to Egypt, skip the pyramids and go to a temple. It's so much more interesting and exciting. Pyramids are huge. They're, wow, ooh. I don't, I don't care about pyramids. I don't care how big the stones were. I don't care how many tons they are. That doesn't impress me. Um, but to answer your question about power, um, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm going to send you some stuff, and you've got to look into the alternate uh, history you know, of there the is, alternate research. I will say this about the obelisks. There are some obelisks, if you strike them, they make a sound, very low frequency throughout them. But going back all those years, there's no examples of electricity in Egypt. Or there's suppressed information where they're hiding it from you. That's kind of the issue on this, right? It's a, either it's the way that Egyptologists say that it is and the research done and then that's the way, or there's maybe a couple of extra theories. And you know what I think it is? I think it's because it's so mysterious. It's I can because- tell you that as Egyptologists, we're not concealing anything. Oh, see, and it, this though, I think is like Masons, like Freemasons. Of course you would say that because you, you don't, you're not the one concealing it. You're doing the great research. You're doing beautiful work. I've your- dated a Freemason. I know there's nothing happening that, that is really hidden. Man, and see, and then, okay, and so there's alternative theories to that, that that's, of course, in the open, there's nothing hidden, but it's really like two shadow, like two sides of the same coin, right? Yes, it's a open face interesting altruistic um, organization with nothing to hide on the surface but at the top levels right and that's what I mean you could say that about anything in government um, any major organizations those things maybe there's some hidden knowledge there that's very interesting I mean wouldn't it be amazing if but you know there's a lot of uh, proof to disprove um, electricity so you got to see it from both sides. It's like looking for it's like looking for Bigfoot, you know. Totally legit. It's totally <laughs> it's legit. Like, yeah, there's a lot of proof to say that there is Bigfoot. There's a lot of proof to say there's not a Bigfoot. Yes. So. Same thing with like round Earth, flat Earth, all of that stuff. There's there's interesting um, evidence you can find on both sides to support both. So it's just kind of what resonates with you, and then that's the path that you choose to go down. Uh, I like the alternate history stuff, but I also am fascinated about the stories and about the characters and the investment to the just the whimsy of it all. You know, it's real romantic the idea of Egypt and all these this traveling and this trade by boat and, you know, all this really cool stuff, just like you said about the mummy, you know, I mean, that's just an awesome film just because it, it makes your mind go nuts, you know, just thinking about these older cultures like that. Exactly. Exactly. When you find out that there really was a person called Imhotep, it's like, (laughs) so the Imhotep is a real thing. Imhotep is a real person. He's the first, he's the first architect in ancient Egypt that came up with the pyramids. Really? Does the story check out in the um, in the mummy, the movie? Like, did they did he really die that way, and was that or was that all fictionalized? Um, we don't know where his tomb is, Ooh. so we cannot tell. But Imhotep became a god in his own right, so he was worshipped after his death as basically the god of medicine, because Imhotep was also a doctor and he invented a lot of the medical instruments that you can see on the walls at Edfu Temple. And even these instruments, some are so similar to what we use today. So that, yeah. But uh, the mummy, oh my God, if you get me started on the mummy, there is so much wrong with that movie. Oh, you want to pick it apart? I, I love it, but you know, it's like you watch it and there's, there's the, you know, the Pharaoh's mistress 
anak sunamun. Yeah. It's based loosely on Tutankhamun's sister. Oh. On Kesenamun. Okay, okay. Um, and Imhotep and Anke Senamun lived about 1,200 years apart from each other. <laughs> oh, that would have been difficult. Yeah. 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 And then you get Seti the first. And this, it's like, Hamunatra doesn't exist, people, by the way. Damn it. Or maybe it does. And that's where Homeboy is buried at, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We got to discover Hamunatra. Yeah. Have you tried doing that, sitting on the oasis and waiting for the sun to set just at the right time? And then the city appears and you ride your horses and camels into it like like hell. That Again, great movie. Uh, in fact, I will go ahead and link it down in the show notes just because it's fun. Um, OK, so I I am curious, though, what do you think? Um, I know I know you're not a fan of the pyramids, but what do you think that they were used for? Just as an as an Egyptologist, I was curious because I. Um, what what's interesting about the like temples that you look at and what what's cool about them and entertaining about them is the history of the story but all the ornate carvings and paintings that mm-hmm. aren't found in the pyramids and that's what's interesting too is that no inscriptions no paintings no nothing like that no burials it's just odd you know so i'm just curious to see what you think that the pyramids were used for people talk about the pyramids and they think of the three well, then you have but the over- Pyramid of Saqqara, the Bent Pyramid, the Red Pyramid. We had a guy named Jeff Drum on, and he's uh, been over there and done a ton of really interesting research. He would love that episode. And he thinks that they were chemical factories, and it's fascinating. He does a whole presentation. He's checked all these pyramids out. It's really, really interesting. Okay, okay. I will tell you the Egyptological point of view. Please. Um, there's over 100 pyramids in Egypt. Um as an Egyptologist, you have to be prepared for pyramid questions, even if they're not your speciality. So we do look into it a lot. Um, I see comments on YouTube often where people say, but there was never a mummy of a pharaoh found inside a pyramid. Well, sorry to prove you wrong. We have several that were found. Um, we have many examples that they were used as tombs. Uh, we even have the Pyramid of Sesostris III, um, which is known as the Black Pyramid. And that was used as his pyramid, as his tomb. His daughter, Sobek Neferu, who is possibly the first female pharaoh, and also another pharaoh called Hora Webra. And Hora Webra's tomb inside the pyramid was found completely intact. Sarcophagus, car statue, death mask, and his skull is still inside his death mask. He's still inside his death mask. Damn. So we do have examples, and we also know that um, another mummy was found inside a, to- inside a pyramid that we believe could be Pepe the first or Pepe the second. Um, and his his mummy is on display at the the Imhotep Museum at Saqqara. So we do have examples of this, and we have inside um, of pyramids we have sarcophagi. Some of the pyramids are not don't have any markings on the outside, but that's not strange because a pyramid should be a clean um, a clean shape. If you look at hieroglyphs when a pyramid is shown, it is a clean shape that's meant to reflect the sun's rays because it represents the mound of earth from which the world was created. So that's why we have a pyramid that's smooth on the outside. You can see at the top of Kafra's pyramid how it should have been smooth because we have that little nice capstone right. at the top. Um, but with the, the pyramid of Minkaura, we can see on the outside, it says basically resting place of the king in hieroglyphs on the outside. We have inside the, the, the pyramid of Unas, the entire pyramid texts, which speak about how the Pharaoh's body that is interred in this tomb will enter into the next life to meet with Osiris. So we have a lot of examples that pyramids are tombs. You, yeah, you do. And it sounds like a few for sure. I think it's, I guess, just number of, right? So if there's a hundred and you found it in five, 
then that's, you know, a little different. Or it would depend, I guess, on the ratio, right? Um, because it is interesting, like I said, that uh, people have found so many different ideas and put the materials that were used in the pyramids together in the same condition and kind of created mock mini uh, remember, examples. Remember as well, in Sudan, there are also pyramids in Nubia. And they're very tightly packed together. They're not very big. They're about two stories high. And at the front of each of them is its own mortuary temple. So by the time of the 25th dynasty, when the Nubians were in Egypt, they took the idea, hey, cool, let's make a pyramid tomb, but let's do now what the new kingdom pharaohs are doing and have a mortuary temple, and they just put the two together. That, and that's so what I'm saying. See the, maybe, maybe the later pyramids were used as tombs because the dynasty lost the knowledge of what they were originally used for. And so even, even in the second dynasty thought, oh man, you know, these are great, uh, but we didn't find any bodies. This would make a great place for my dead corpse to lay forever. Uh, you know, and maybe that's the, what they did later. You see, the first pyramid was built in the third dynasty by um, Pharaoh, jo Pharaoh Joza. Uh, which is the step pyramid at Saqqara invented by Imhotep. And when you see how it was constructed, it is constructed how most tombs are constructed at the time, which is a mastaba, which is one level, the shaft going down and the burial chamber underneath. But Imhotep being this genius came up with the idea, hey, let's put another mastaba on top of this one mastaba. So you can see where the first mastaba was extended and another one was added on top. And then you can see from there, they obviously thought, okay, this looks cool. And they put another one and another one and another one. And they ended up with that shape. So from there, they thought, okay, let's try and do this in a smoother style. So Pharaoh Djoza, which is the first ever pyramid, the step pyramid, we know is a tomb because his sarcophagus was inside there. His mummified foot was found still inside the sarcophagus. That's, that's the first ever pyramid built. And it's definitely a tomb. And, I, and, I have and heard inside, inside of the step pyramid, we have rooms which are designed exactly how a mastaba would be designed. And we have a lot of people say that Pharaoh Unas was the first pharaoh to have text inside. No, actually, the first ever pyramid had text inside and had images inside of the pharaoh trying to get to the afterlife. So the first ever pyramid we have is a tomb. And from there, every pyramid that has been found has a sarcophagus inside. And a lot of pyramids have been found with bodies or burial goods inside. Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, and again, I, I mean, that it, it entirely possible. Uh, my mind just kind of goes a little bit more conspiratorial just because that's the way I'm wired. I'm just wired to kind of question everything. And uh, yeah, yeah, question so it. it may be that they just took all these bodies later and to cover up the information, kind of like they deliberately buried uh, Gobekli Tepe, right? They covered it up deliberately. You can tell that. Um, and so maybe they were like, oh, God, we can't let people know that these were for free energy or chemical factories. Let's pitch a body in there. And they'll think that we just buried people here. Here, go scribble some stuff on the wall real quick. It didn't look like it was deliberately done that way. And what's really interesting about uh, Jeff's work is the way that the reduction chambers and in pressure, and he, he shows all of this. It's like an ammonia factory. And this is why they... Uh, deified uh, cows, you know, for cattle dung to make pneumonia out of the fertilizer that they produced. And then uh, the scarab, which is really just a dung beetle. So it went and collected dung. And all this imagery points to his hypothesis, which is fascinating, man. I've, I'll send you the link to that episode. I highly recommend you check it out just for an alternative perception about the okay. uh, purpose, because it's just fascinating. And he's done some tremendous work on it. So okay. um, I, I do like uh, that pyramids are found all over the damn place as well, because you find them in you know Cambodia, Guatemala, all over South America. You find them in, um, like I said, Cambodia. Uh, there's rumors to be some in Antarctica, uh, Bosnia. There's pyramids everywhere. So what do you think that's about? Because some of the shapes are different, but they have such similar features and the way in which they're constructed, the design, perhaps the function. Um, so what do you think the global obsession with pyramids are? Why do you think we find them everywhere? Well, 
With the pyramids in South America, those are built thousands of years after we have the pyramids in Egypt. So, you know, there can't be a correlation between, oh, they, the Egyptians went there and said, hey, you need to make pyramids, because they wouldn't have, because the dating is totally wrong. Um, on that, I don't really have an answer because I haven't studied pyramids in other countries. So I'm going to, I'm going to pull a Mariah Carey. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> totally great answer. You can feel free to pull Mariah Carey's whenever you'd like. Uh, it is just interesting because what, what that points to is a global civilization, you know, that influenced each other or perhaps that hundredth monkey effect where they were isolated pockets of civilizations that once one came up with the idea, somehow quantum entanglement style, uh, other civilizations started doing it as well because it's kind of a collective consciousness type of an idea to where if we started it here or we were all connected and everything was a lot more global, which again, I kind of uh, tend to entertain the thought of a little bit more. I think a lot of our history has been not only suppressed, but deliberately lied to us about. And so it's nice to kind of but get what about what about just human instinct, people who seem to think along the same lines? Uh, I'm with you. Um, I think that it's it's interesting, though, the cultures were so different and especially finding things like the pyramid structure. It's a very, very significant thing. And the, especially what you talked about, about the step pyramid, I have heard it uh, spoken about that it was the first one because of its design and it was kind of an evolution in technique. And that's why it had the step. And so it was kind of crude. It was like their first model at it. And then they just got better and better right over time. But the interesting part is so did a lot of other ancient cultures, the Aztecs, the Maya, again, in Cambodia. Uh, they're just found so many places. They're all very unique and distinct, but they're all pretty damn similar in shape and design. And to come up with that non-influenced is just interesting. So like you said, it could be an instinctual thing. It could be kind of like I said, the hundred monkey thing. Sometimes, you know, when you think of an idea and then you hear your idea that you just thought of spoken by somebody else, you're like, what? I just thought of that. And it's one of those connection things. So there may be something deep in the human psyche that connects all of us, uh, which is pretty cool. And then you're kind of influenced on the same things. Like you discover how to make the color blue together you know like indigo blue discovered in egypt and was made over there and then maybe other people started using dyes and things as well along the same lines it, it is interesting though these pockets that pop up which either point to like you said a connection on a deep spiritual level or that there was connection physically between these civilizations so let me ask you this have you heard of the egyptian artifacts found in the grand canyon in the u.s Oh my god. You should check into it. It is so They're cool. They're so freaking fake. Are they really? Have you looked at it? Sorry, as, as an Egyptologist, I spend a lot of time staring at Egyptian art. And the second I saw pictures of that, they are so crude and so fake, I could make better ones. Really? But it, Sorry, and I, I also saw that the documentary done by that old guy who claimed that he was a Freemason. He was not a Freemason. And he was, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling a carrot. He's full of shit. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> you know, uh, again, it's just so cool. I love these ideas. And it's fascinating that um, that you're very sure about your hypothesis, which is also very interesting. I, I like that your heels are dug in onto this concept that you're... Um, no, but I, I spend hours staring at Egyptian art. And I'm also a person who likes collecting Egyptian replicas. And I know what Egyptian art looks like, and I know what it should represent, and I can also read the hieroglyphs. Right. That so when I cool. see pictures of these things that were found in the Grand Canyon that have not been checked by Egyptologists, they are so crude, they are so bad. We have symbols of the Aten combined with other gods. It's, it is just a mess. It is such a cheap... Um, such a cheap reconstruction. Gotcha. Okay. See, and that's interesting. I don't have the eye for it. So we see something like a little bird and a, and a dot and we're like, hell yeah, that's Egypt. And you're like, no, 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 no. That's not right at all. This symbol shouldn't even be in that dynastic period. That's what's so cool. And that's why um, I like talking to folks like you about it because you have so much knowledge uh, about what If you check on eBay, just how many Egyptian antiquities are for sale. And I check this on a weekly basis. Um, 
some of the things that people are claiming are authentic. It's like, come on. They didn't even take the Pier 1 import sticker off the bottom of it, right? Yeah, yeah. You can still see the made in China that's been right. scratched at the bottom. <laughs> um, and even inside museums, we have pieces which you can look at specifically from the 12th dynasty. And you can go, hmm, first intermediate period. Hmm, that is some ugly Egyptian art. And a lot of people just contributed to Egypt falling apart, but we have some amazing art from the 12th dynasty, but a lot of art from the 12th dynasty that is really ugly. And some of it I've seen and I've gone, hmm, sorry, but that is a fake. Interesting. So if it's ugly and in that period, you know, just based on the style and the craftsmanship, whether it's authentic oh, yeah. or not, that's interesting. Oh, yeah. You can also, you can tell also by the style of the art because it evolves and every period has its own style. So if you can see Ptolemaic Egyptian art, I don't like Ptolemaic Egyptian art. It gets a very bad reputation for being ugly, but sorry, it is ugly because it has a Greek influence and everything has become rounded and lumpy. And I don't like that. Yeah. They just really let themselves go with it. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. They just gave up altogether. Exactly. So, so uh, when you look at Egyptian art, you can start to notice. So you start you... to know. Go ahead, please. No, no. You, you, you just start to know. You start to know who, how it was made, who made it. Um, yeah, you can see when some things are fake. That's crazy. You're like, that's like a 12th dynasty Banksy. You know, you like can tell the artist uh, down to the chisel marks. That's pretty interesting. I have my own death mask. And when I took that thing out of Egypt, I got stopped at the airport. And I actually, I was like, come on, come on. This is, it's showing a, a death mask and it has a full beard. And I'm like, I unwrapped it. I said, it looks like me. How can you think this is? And they didn't want to let me take it out. I had to get someone from the ministry to come down and say, oh, no, sorry, this is a fake. <laughs> I mean, how often does that happen, though, with tourists going over there getting souvenirs and then people getting stopping them thinking that they're artifacts that they're trying to smuggle out? It happens all the time. <laughs> I, saw, I saw an article in a newspaper a while back. They were like, Egyptian authorities foil plot to take antiquities out of Egypt. And I looked at the picture and thought, these things are all freaking fake. <laughs> they got them at the gift shop at the airport, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Yeah, it's just insane. Are there any pieces in an, in a museum right now that you've walked up to that you can go, that is fake? What's the worst one that you've seen? Um, I'm trying to think. I've seen some really bad ones. Yeah. And have you brought this to the attention of anybody in the museum and been like, you know, that's fake, right? Yeah. Well, there's some very convincing fakes. Like there was a statue of Teti Sheri which I look at it today and I still go, sorry, but I'm sure that is real. I don't know how you came up with the, the idea that that's a fake. Um, but in the museum here in Florence, there's a, a stealer of a husband and wife from the 12th dynasty. And I just look at that thing and I go, sorry, but that it does not look real. You know, and you hear of um, like billionaires and stuff doing this, they'll pay people to to create such incredibly realistic um, replicas and then they'll just take the real one home, you know, and then they'll put that one up in a museum. They're like, yeah, it's right over here. It's in this museum in Florence. And uh, Curtis is like, no, it's in this house, this guy's house, because that's a fake. And I mean, how often- I would never even get a replica made of that steel. That's so ugly. Oh, just (laughs) paintings. I mean, uh, hieroglyphs, statues, everything. I bet you that happens all the time. It actually would make you question if that's possible and that prevalent, how much actual history is in museums or is it just kind of like a picture of history? It's not I can real. tell you now, the bust of Nefertiti in Berlin, it is real. That image we see of Nefertiti, it was found in Amana, it is real. But the one on display is not the real one. Damn, see, this is what I'm talking about. Like they don't put real dinosaur bones out. You know what I mean? Yeah, like I, I look at that and I go, there's something off about it and there's something, the base of Nefertiti's bust. When you look at the one that's on display now in Berlin, she has no limestone chippings 
at the bottom of her bust. It is completely flat. The paint gets cut off right there. When you look at pictures of the day it was taken out of the ground, she has about a four centimeter um, line going at the bottom of her bust of just plain, undecorated, unpainted limestone. And that's what you'd expect. Yeah. Interesting. And then you look at the one in Berlin and it's like, have they sanded it down? But they wouldn't do that. Yeah, why would they do that? So this is definitely, the real one is locked away somewhere. We know that in World War II, the real Nefertiti bust was taken away and put somewhere. And it was put somewhere in Austria, underground, and to this day, the government won't let anybody check inside this vault. I bet you the it's I bet it's so prevalent. I and I, it, I it just think so to prevalent. myself I just think to myself, sorry, but the real Nefertiti bust is probably locked away in there or somewhere in a basement being kept safe. Because the museum was so badly damaged during the war, they want to preserve this piece of history. So they're just displaying a fake. Yeah. And, and like I said, I, I bet it happens way more than we think. Uh, and people are just sitting on the real ones. And, it, and even faking history that way. Do you think that that's possible? That they could have made up a bunch of statues and stuff, said that they were in this dynasty and just presented these information things as fact, but they're really not and that the whole thing's manufactured? Is that no. possible at all, Curtis? No, that's being done these days. Okay, gotcha. That is being done these days by an alternative group trying to push a different agenda. There is a statue of fake lapis, um, which has got like 23,000 likes on this picture on Instagram. And they, they call it the unnamed pharaoh. And all the comments, people are like, oh my God, he looks like Wesley Snipes. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, he does. He does look like Wesley Snipes. But sorry, why does he have a seashell stuck to his head that they say you know, came from the, the, the ocean? Um, people don't seem to check up on the facts about this, and they're believing now that this is a bust of a pharaoh that was found. Biggest problem is there's no such huge piece of lapis that's ever been found, because that comes from Afghanistan. It's only one place it can be found. The second thing is facial features are wrong. And he has a vulture and a cobra at the top of his crown, which was only ever worn by Tut. Okay. I'm grateful you mentioned that because I want to ask you about something. So uh, have you ever heard of the Mandela effect? Yes. Okay. Do you think that that applies to um, the statue that you're talking about, about King Tut's uh, bust, the helmet that he wore? The vulture, people don't remember. Uh, the snake is all we remember is the cobra. The vulture is basically an artifact from another dimension that we slipped into. Do you remember it always in your mind, having the vulture and the cobra? Always. It always did to you? Always. Okay, that's but interesting. But the funny thing is, a vulture and a cobra worn on a headdress is only worn by a female. Which is another weird thing, right? Like, why would Tut have that? Exactly. So I have my theory that the... The, 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 the death mask of Tut is not actually his. It's his face, but we know the face was changed to his face. But the actual gold around it, the Nemes, was not intended for him. Like they photoshopped him out? They photoshopped his face into the, into the crown that we see? Well, it could have been a gift. Like a re-gift? Yeah, so from the person I'm thinking it's from, because this is the only female from that time that we know that wore a vulture and a, a vulture and a cobra. I believe it's from Tut's grandmother. Damn. So Tut yeah. took Gma's bust around and just put his face on it and that's that's the whole thing? I think she gifted it to him. Because she gifted him several other pieces. It's kind of like a picture of herself and he went and photoshopped his face on top of it. Like, thanks, Gma, but I'm going to go ahead and do this my way. That's interesting. That dog is adorable, by the way. 
<laughs> Thank you. She's like looking at me like, hey, what's going on? Why are you ignoring me? Yeah. She's like, what are we doing here? What are you talking about Egypt and shit? Uh, so let, let me ask you this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a dog friendly show, man. Please. Yeah. Bring him on in. Um, we uh, are probably going to wrap it up here. I just wanted to ask you one more thing just because I'm curious because if I, like I said, I do a lot of research into the alternatives on this and you do a lot of research on the officials on this. And so um, I, I want to ask you about Robert Schock's work with the Sphinx enclosure and the water erosion. Have you done any looking into that? <laughs> By the smile, um, I'm going to say yes. And you have thoughts. Yes. Go ahead. I have had like a five hour conversation with somebody about this and I just kept going around in circles. And we actually had a geologist who had studied the Sphinx and he had the same explanation that I had given. When you get very strong winds with the very fine sand in Egypt, and that's blowing against limestone, which is a very soft stone. If you go and scratch it, it's just going to crumble. You have, it's basically sandblasting the Sphinx. So the Sphinx is being sandblasted when there's sandstorms. And then when eventually it does rain in Egypt, because it does rain, when that rain comes, the water hits that limestone and where it's been sandblasted, it starts to fall away. That would explain the water erosion on any artifact, on any structure that you would find in Egypt, because they all have water damage. It seems, and I think his argument um, was is that it had so much and then it was just rushing in and that it was clearly because I think that he went down the argument as well of the wind erosion versus water erosion and same thing, materials, um, being a geologist. Again, this is what we were talking about earlier. You can find but evidence it can on flash either side. Flood. It can flash flood in Egypt. We know the Valley of the Kings has been flooded several times because we have an inscription from a... <sighs> From a scribe, I believe, at the time um, in the 20th dynasty. And he wrote that he's taking his kids to go and see a waterfall in the Valley of the Kings, which means it is flash flooding and the water is coming over into the Valley of the Kings. That's how Tut's tomb evaded people for so many years, because his tomb was covered by rubble from a flash flood from the debris from digging other tombs and it was all just pushed into the little basin which is where his tomb was damn okay that's it's so very we can get examples of bad water erosion but it's a combination of wind sand and rain okay it's all of it yeah and and it's brilliant like i said and i uh, i just appreciate your perspective because you've got way more knowledge on the um, official story of the egyptian past than I do. And so no, I, I I enjoy, though, being able to ask you about this and get your perception on it, because honestly, I didn't know uh, any other mummies were found in any pyramids whatsoever. It's pretty much a blanket statement that you come across whenever you do that kind of stuff. And so, but to find out, maybe the argument comes in that, yes, a couple of them had mummies in it, but then you look at the time period, then you look at, um, you know, the number of pyramids that had mummies found in them and inscriptions and vice versa uh, versus the ones that didn't and then the different internals and stuff. So it is interesting, like I said, to kind of get all avenues on this. And that's what we do on the show. We want to make sure that we cover all bases because I talk about selfishly. I talk about the alternative history stuff a lot only because I find it fascinating. It's fun. And uh, I think there's some really compelling evidence there. But like you, like we, again, have already talked about a few times on this. It's just there's so much evidence on both sides that it is pretty tricky. Uh, but it's nice to be able to talk about all of it. So that's what's so cool. So um, exactly. And as an Egyptologist, you have to stay up to date also on what this alternative. Yeah. What these batshit is. crazy theories are all about. Yeah. <laughs> because when you get asked about it and eventually you will get asked about it, you have to be able to say, well, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you have to stay up to date on all of these things. And some of these things that you read and you even get some Egyptologists that come up with some really crazy theories. Um, I know an Egyptologist that came up with a theory about Moses um, and so many people believe Moses is Akhenaten and all of this stuff. And oh I'm my like, God, I, I love it. Think, <laughs> I'm like, I don't even think Moses happened. Sorry. 
Interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an allegory, right? It's more allegorical. And we uh, we talk about that here on the show, too, with astrotheology and that the Bible and the religious texts were really just more like star maps and they were kind of hints, you know, at uh, when to plant um, all of those things and good kind of uh, moral fables or stories to just keep everybody in line to say, hey, don't screw up because here's a story about it. I so believe that as well. I believe a lot of stories in the Bible are not factual history stories it is a outline of morals yeah yeah it's just kind of a good guide right yeah exactly exactly especially old testament uh yo god yeah yeah the old testament god was just totally different i mean and we uh it We've gone down those rabbit holes quite a bit. And even in, um, there's some incredible scripture. If you want, I'll send you the copy of it. I uh, just kind of went through and wrote down some stuff. It, it's basically uh, laying out that perhaps um, that the God in the Bible was actually Satan. And there's a bunch of scripture to back that up. If you follow like the official narrative, but it's it's kind of woven within there. I'll send you the, the stuff. It's pretty fun. Uh, another uh, just fun rabbit hole for you to go down there. Um, well, did you, so tell me about what you've got coming up. I know you're, Nefertiti documentary. Um, and then what do you, what are you looking forward to after that's released? What's the next thing you're working on? So 6th of December is very exciting because that is the anniversary of discovering Nefertiti's bust in Almana. Yeah. And I have been working on a new documentary, which will be released on that same day on YouTube. Um, Basically, looking for Nefertiti's mummy. So there's this theory that's been going around for a while now that Nefertiti is the younger lady found in a tomb called KV-35. And uh, there's a lot of evidence to say she's not Nefertiti, which we present in the documentary. And we present forward another mummy, who was found in KV-21, an undecorated tomb, next to another mummy who is headless. And these mummies share DNA with Tutankhamun. That's crazy. And you have to watch the documentary to find out. So it's going to be called Nefertiti, Where's Her Mummy? And we investigate all aspects of where her mummy could be, but we focus on the possibility of her being one of the mummies from KV-21 and possibly the other mummy being Tut's sister. Curtis Ryan Woodside, we are going to be linking all of the ways to find you down in the show notes. Absolutely fascinating work, man. You do some awesome, awesome stuff. And all of the ways, of course, like I said, to find you will be down there. So y'all make sure that you go check him out. Uh, this has been an honor, man. This has been a true pleasure Thank of you. mine. So you are welcome back anytime. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you, Brandon. It's been so much fun just to to chat about history. Um, yeah, I, I recommend everybody go and look at those weird things that were found in the Grand Canyon because... Hell yeah. It is so fake. <laughs> but it's so much fun. I don't even care if it's real. Oh. It's awesome. <laughs> oh. All right, Curtis, we'll keep up with you, man. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Want to give a huge shout out and thanks to Curtis Ryan Woodside for spending some time and spitting some knowledge with us here on the show. It is always fascinating to me to get the uh, both sides of the opinion on this. You know what I mean? So, and we've talked about this in the show quite a bit, uh, that you can find evidence for everything, even if it's contradictory. So Curtis's work is amazing. He does some incredible deep dives into actual Egyptian history from the Egyptological perspective, which is very hard to say. Uh, and uh, he just does a wonderful job, guys. So go check out all the ways to find him in the show notes. His films are wonderful. They're up on YouTube, and that will be linked down there as well. Also linked down there is Vinny the Saint. The music that you are listening to right now is by Good Buddy, and he is found down there. He's working on uh, some new stuff, so definitely go check him out. And we're we're grateful that uh, he lets us use this stuff on the show because it's wonderful and I love his music and I love him as a person. He's great. 
So uh, down in the show notes, also a third uh, trial for you down there is expandingrealitypodcast.com. That is where links to all socials. If you want to expand your experience with us here on the show, that's how you can do so. So uh, go out into this beautiful, mysterious, amazing place. Look for some Egyptian artifacts all over the place. They might be fakes. Uh, Curtis can help you out with that if you are on the fence. But uh, go take a look around, guys. This is a beautiful place, and you might stumble across some stuff. They apparently left shit everywhere, so just go check it out. Uh, While you're out there doing so, uh, be nice to everybody that you come across by a coffee or a meal or a water for somebody in line behind you or around you, adjacent to you, whatever. Uh, Of course, pick up a piece of litter. Get out of the left-hand lane, and then, as always, guys, go out into this beautiful place, whatever it is, and y'all just be good to one another. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time.